Q&A, Q&A time. So, I thought I'd celebrate my first year of uh, officially being a YouTube creator by opening up the floor for some questions that some of you have had over the course of the last year since I've been doing videos. What questions do you have for me? What questions do you have about bass playing? Um, I'm really excited and really happy to answer some of your questions today. So, let's get started. Here's one of the first ones I got on YouTube. From Cove B, I'd like to know your personal impressions on gut strings in today's jazz scene. First of all, I love the sound of gut strings. They're punchy, they're clear, they're powerful, and when you can hear them correctly, they speak awesomely. I think the updates we have in technology as far as the bass being amplified makes it much easier uh, and much more audible for bassists that choose to play gut strings. I think they sound wonderful. Unfortunately, they're not really part of what my sound is for me in my head, but I am a huge fan of people who play gut strings and when it's done well and you can hear it, it's amazing. From Ben K, any tips on starting a new bassist on French after they transition from cello? I'm a middle school strings teacher and primarily a German bow guy. I fought with my French bow over time and got it to work, but I find I'm having difficulty with my students. I'm having a few try out German too. Ben, I think you answered part of your question there. You play the German bow. It's the bow you're most comfortable with. It naturally serves to say that you're probably gonna be the most comfortable teaching that bow to your young students. Young students who don't have a lot of experience with any other type of bow. My advice to you would be to start them on German. The German grip is a little easier to get when you're a younger student. The French bow grip has a little more finesse involved with it. My personal experience is that I played French first in high school, and then when I went to college, my teacher said, I don't play French, I'm starting you on German, it's my area of expertise, and I played German for 15 years before I came back to playing French again. So. You're the teacher, it's in your best interest to decide what you can teach best, and I tend to believe that the German bow grip is slightly easier than the French bow grip is. Here's one from My Name is Ben. How do you go about composing slash songwriting on the bass? And on a similar note, how does one go about, quote, finding their voice? Thanks and keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Um, I usually just go by what I hear. Sometimes compositions will find themselves when you're messing around on chords on the piano. Uh, sometimes if I'm playing a line or coming up with something funky on the bass, something will emerge, or if I'm playing a melody or messing with chords on the bass. You can never tell when inspiration is gonna hit. You just have to be prepared to document it so that you can save it for later. As far as finding your voice goes, you have to keep doing it. You have to keep on transcribing, practicing, and making gigs, whether they're good or not. A great friend of mine just said, you gotta put sand in the box. We don't always make sand castles, but we gotta keep putting sand in the box so when it's time to do that, we're ready to do it. So keep putting sand in your box. Here's one from Facebook and my friend Greg. I use a full circle with the Claris amp, but I wondered what EQ setting you use for optimum volume and tone. This is actually a subject that I'm going to cover in a future video. Specifically, how do we set an amp for acoustic bass? Couple of quick things. One is don't forget that it's an acoustic instrument and your amplified tone should be a combination of what's coming off the bass and what's coming out of the amp. I've always believe this. A second tip is to start with everything flat and go from there. Don't try to overly boost or overly cut anything. Find out what everything at 12 o'clock sounds like first and then make small adjustments. Lastly, my piece of advice would be from the engineer field, which is it's always much better to cut than to boost. So. Try first cutting frequencies and see what you get before you start turning up the bottom end, before you start accentuating middle frequencies. See what you can take away and how much better that makes the sound before you actually start boosting things. So, I hope that helps. Here's one from Nathan Harmon. 
A lot of the language I use comes straight from transcribing musicians I like. A lot of PC. I love that. And fine, when I'm playing, a lot of these lines just come out naturally. For you, are there any notable lines slash phrases that you've borrowed over time that come out in your playing? And if so, which players slash songs these came from? Yes, Nathan, I would say about all of them. <laughs> Seriously, you should be copying, copying, copying as much as possible and as many players as possible. The golden rule is you want to copy about 10 to 15 guys and what comes out the other end should be you. On the other hand, if you copy one or two guys, then it's going to be pretty easy to hear that you're copying that one person, if that makes sense at all. As far as specific licks and specific songs, oh yes, I do. I steal often, as often as possible. When I hear something that really speaks to me, I try to copy it in all 12 keys. And this is a good piece of advice for everybody. If you hear music that speaks to you, it means it's inside of you. It's inside of your DNA. I can probably think of 100 licks right now, whether they're bass lines, solo licks, uh, or other things that I've stolen from great masters like Ray Brown, Ron Carter, John Patitucci, Christian McBride, and the list is endless. So keep on stealing, your stuff will come out. Remember what Clark Terry said, the three steps were imitation, assimilation, and innovation. So this next one's from Instagram. This is from Goldman's Hayes. What rig do you run these days for live performances? Amps, pedals, instrument? Well, as far as my amps go, I have a couple of amps that I like to use for my double bass mostly. They're combo amps. I use these amps when I don't need a lot of power. I use an acoustic image Contra combo that's 300 watts. I also use a Galien Kruger micro bass 150 watt amp. If I need anything louder, I use a Mark Bass 210 cabinet or an Epiphany 310, and I use amp heads made by Aguilar and Walter Woods. As far as pedals go, I'm not really a big pedal guy. There's one pedal that I like to pull out every once in a while, and that's the OC2 Boss Octaver pedal, which is like the voice of God if you've never ran through one. It's amazing. Now my instruments are my bread and butter, especially my double bass. I play a 1972 Pullman Gamba bass that has beautiful carvings. It sounds wonderful. It's somewhere between a three quarters. It has a three quarter top with a seven eighths bottom. I use Tomastic Spiracore Vike gauge strings. I tried other strings and I keep coming back to the Spiracores because they have that, that point that I like. There's a little pop in the note in the mid range definition to help me cut through whatever situation I'm playing on. My other bases are my Frankenstein fretless, which is made from warmth parts and EMG pickups. I've had this bass longer than any other instrument I own. It was put together in the early 90s. I also play an MTD six string, which I traded another bass for. It was used. I dropped Bartolini pickups in it. It's a great sounding hi-fi instrument when I need to get an extended range or I feel like playing really solo type things. And one of my workhorse basses is my Fender Getty Lee Jazz Bass. First of all, I own a Fender Getty Lee Jazz Bass because Getty Lee is the greatest bass player ever and the reason I play the instrument. Second of all, it's a really, really great all around workhorse instrument that sounds fantastic in a variety of bags. Mine was made in Japan and I dropped in a Sadowski preamp so when I need to get a really hi-fi sound out of it and I kick in that preamp, that thing crushes. So those are my main instruments pretty much. By the way, Goldman's Haze uh, is with the incredible group Code Orange. If you've never heard of Code Orange, check them out. I'm very, very proud to say that they all attended 
the Pittsburgh High School for the Creative and Performing Arts where I still teach. I've been teaching there since 2005 and I got to see them all come up through the program and they all were devoted to music as teenagers and now they are really making it big and I'm happy to say that I knew them way back when and we're all proud of you guys. Keep doing what you're doing. Here's one from uh, Instagram friend Leighton McKinley Harrell. Favorite record or records featuring Mr. Bob Cranshaw? That one is pretty easy. Uh, my personal favorite records are uh, Mary Lou Williams Zoning, where he's playing electric bass, Stanley Turrentine Hustlin', and the very first record I think I heard him on, uh, Sonny Rollins' The Bridge. I mean, you could literally pick any record and he's absolutely genius, but those are probably my three favorites. Okay, this one's from my buddy AJ on Instagram. PT, if you could play in any rock band in the world besides your obvious favorite, Rush, what would your choice be? This one was tough. You know, I was thinking about this. There's a lot of great rock bands I would love to play with. The conundrum is there are so many great bass players, I would hate to pull somebody out of a group so that I wouldn't get to hear them. Besides Rush, it would be Van Halen in a second. Hands down, Van Halen. Van Halen is incredible, and Eddie Van Halen is a bona fide, super musical genius on his instrument. And to have an opportunity to play with a super musical genius uh, is one I can't turn down. Van Halen for sure. Okay, I hope I'm saying this one correctly. This is from Instagram. Ike Chukwu Long. What do you do to stay inspired and how do you keep focused for practice? Uh, I think one of the key things is to have a very healthy uh, record collection, as you've seen behind me in my videos. Uh, I try to feed myself as much as possible with different sounds, new sounds, great sounds, recordings. It keeps me incredibly motivated. There's always a bar that I'm trying to reach that I, I haven't quite gotten to yet. I'm still trying to catch up to my record collection. Other than that, when you talk about practice, um, I think it's really important that you have a plan. Practice is very much like working out. There's a lot of similarities I've found. We should do a warm up. We should have a thing that we walk through before we get to our heavy lifting. Um, we have to have a routine that helps prime us mentally and physically to get into the act of playing. So I found mostly what works for me is to have a series of exercises that I walk through to get me ready to really work on what I'm going to work on for that day. I talked about doing some simple diatonic exercises in this video earlier. I also played through some really great string crossing exercises by Ron Carter, and I found that having a routine, just like working out, can really get you in the right mindset and focus when it's time to deal with what you have to practice. So, good luck. Here's another one from Instagram from Chris Latta. That's weird, my wife has that same last name. Where did you get that cool artwork behind you? You mean this cool artwork? Well, lucky viewers of YouTube, if you're interested at all in this very beautiful artwork, my wife has been painting all through lockdown. She has paintings of all size and shape and subject. She's quite amazing. She sold quite a few paintings already. I really enjoy these two pieces, which she actually painted specifically for my space using these colors. Thank you, honey. And her work is available for purchase at any time if you're interested. Also, please take the time to check out my wife's YouTube channel, which she is doing an incredible job of maintaining and posting new content to every single week. She's an incredibly beautiful and talented actress and singer. Here's another one from Instagram from my good friend Nate. When you're teaching beginner bass players, what are the most important things to address in the first couple of lessons? I tend to go very basic, Nate. Uh, musical foundation starts with rhythm. Can you keep time? Can you count to four? Can you divide quarter notes into eighth notes? That kind of thing. Very easy rhythmic exercises 
and getting comfortable holding the instrument, whether it's electric bass, whether it's double bass, standing, balance, and make a sound with the instrument. Very basic things. Rhythm, making a sound, and making that sound in time. Those are the first couple of things that I would work on with a beginner. Good luck. I actually got a few questions on the process of transcription, so I'm just gonna pick one of those questions and hopefully that'll answer uh, what a few of you wanted to know about my style of transcribing. This one's from Amamet859. Do you have any tips or advices for transcribing a tune or solo that you don't even know its chords and analyzing the chord progression? Also, I wanna know about your absolutely gorgeous Pullman bass. So I'm editing this video and I get to this question and I listen and I didn't even really answer it. So I thought I would cut in and give you a straightforward answer. That's to sing. Sing everything you want to figure out. If you want to transcribe something, learn to sing it first. Scuba doobum doobum deep da da. Figure out what you sang. Learn it on your instrument, note by note. It's as simple as that. Transcription starts here. You sing. You audiate what you heard. You figure out what you sang period. Now as far as chords go, you've got to spend some time on the piano. If you haven't spent time on the piano, you need to sit down and know how to play your dominant sevenths, your minor sevenths, your major sevenths, uh, your variations of chords augmented diminished. Start playing them. You'll start to hear them eventually. I remember that the first chord I ever recognized without a keyboard in front of me was the sus chord. It's because I'd been practicing it and listening to it on albums. And one day I suddenly heard a sus chord and I was able to recognize it immediately. That's because I spent time at the piano, playing the chords and singing through them. Sing and play. That's the key to transcription. It's got to start here, here, and then here. Good luck. Also, you want to know about my Pullman. I briefly talked about it earlier. It's a 1972. Uh, I played another bass of unknown origin before that for about seven years that was huge. It was a great sounding instrument. It was almost a full size instrument. It was getting to be kind of a pain hauling around on gigs. I wanted something smaller. I wanted something that had kind of a pedigree or a name so if I decided to sell it, I could make all my money back. I looked online uh, basically in places uh, within about five to six hours from Pittsburgh where I live. Um, there are great places both east of here and west of here and I made an appointment at the Cincinnati Bay Cellar and they were wonderful. I got to go to a big room uh, where I, I had it all to myself for an hour and I got to play basses that were as expensive as $200,000 and inexpensive as $1,000 uh, and really hear things. And this bass just had something special and I wanted something I could really work with, something that wasn't gonna be like a potato chip if I was gonna be gigging on it six nights a week. So it's actually opened up a lot more since I bought it. It sounds better now than it did in 2014 and it'll continue to sound good like wooden instruments often do, but I love it. It's a tank. Uh, I've knocked it around a few times, unfortunately, and it hasn't, fortunately, uh, cracked or had anything major with it. Uh, I got lucky. This is from Earn Crab. What do you think about the electric bass in jazz? Can it fit in more traditional jazz settings like straight ahead, big band, etc.? What are some tips for electric players getting into jazz? And also, people wanted to know my opinions about different models. First of all, to quote one of my heroes, Bob Cranshaw, a bass is a bass is a bass. If you're gonna swing, if you're gonna play high level jazz music, you should be able to do it uh, on a double bass, on an electric bass, even if you have to play keyboard bass on a gig, you should be able to swing. So given any instrument, there are a couple of variables. You gotta play great time, you gotta play with a nice wide note, and you gotta limit, I found, the attack of the instrument. So on electric bass, um, you, you don't wanna have a stringy, punchy kind of attack. You want to have a broad, connected kind of sound. That goes a long way towards being able to swing. But it all starts with time. You got to play in time. You got to play good notes that swing and really happen. I love the electric bass and jazz. Bob Cranshaw did hundreds of records where he's absolutely crushing it 
on electric bass. Uh, so did John Lee. There's any number of players, Anthony Jackson, Monk Montgomery. We know that you can swing on the instrument and I don't see that huge of a difference. I love playing double bass because there's a very percussive and acoustic quality about playing the instrument with a group, but I feel like you should be able to do that on electric bass if that's really your goal. Check those guys out, make your beat nice and wide and make sure your time is really strong. I think the electric bass can totally swing. Also, I feel like you gotta get a bass that sounds good. A bass that sounds right for playing the bottom of the music. I think that's why a lot of people tend to choose Fenders. It's why I still own a Fender. When I need to play bass, when I need to lay down serious bottom end, the Fender Jazz Bass is a no-brainer choice for me because that instrument with no coloration is gonna sound thick and meaty and it's gonna give a really great foundation to anything I put on top of it. So I think that's why we continue to see Fender and Fender style instruments. There's something really hard about that design concept that you can really improve on. It's really been consistent over the years and it sounds amazing. So I'm not endorsing Fender, but hey, Fender, you can sponsor me if you like. Here's another Instagram from Great Auntie. What are your quote, guilty pleasure favorite songs. Ooh, this is tough, see, because I'm a serious jazz musician, and if I were to show any kind of vulnerability right now on my YouTube channel, I might risk losing a large portion of my subscribers because they don't think I'm as serious as I should be. But um, I have to say, my wife and I uh, bonded over disco music. Um, I tend to have a real soft spot when it comes to the Tramps and the Bee Gees, um, Cool and the Gang. Like, there's something about disco that is a super, super guilty pleasure for me and my wife. Now, as far as songs go, uh, I'll give you three. I'll say Disco Inferno by the Tramps, Night Fever by the Bee Gees. Whew, that's a banger. My third would probably be T.S.O.P. by M.F.S.B. You know, the Soul Train theme. That one's pretty awesome. And I'm gonna let Great Auntie have another question because she's my aunt after all. What is your favorite U.S. city you've performed in and why? Venue. This is a really good question. Um, right off the bat, my first thought is I love playing in New York. Um, the energy of the city, knowing that you're in New York, the number of great musicians that are there, the, the legacy of the people that have been on the same stage as you. I've played the Blue Note several times um, with different artists, and that's always been a huge treat for me, whether it was Maynard Ferguson or Stanley Turrentine. But there's another city I really loved playing, and, and it has a special place in my heart, and that was Denver, Colorado. I've been there a couple of times, and that city was just amazing. It had great, great crowds of people that were really into the music, and it's one of the most beautiful cities I've ever seen in my life. The Rocky Mountains off in the distance uh, just made it so picturesque, and it's a city that's kind of stuck in my head ever since I got to play there, so I really hope I get to go back. And our last question from Instagram again, from George Belmont. What does your routine look like for maintaining your intonation? Also, any advice for improving melodicism on the upright? I find it so much harder to play strong, melodic solo lines on the upright than I do on the electric. Okay, two-part question. So the first part of your question was about intonation. Here's a huge conclusion that I came to uh, a while ago about intonation. Good intonation is not a place you arrive at, it's a place you have to constantly maintain. Very similar to like in the gym, you know, you're trying to bench 225 pounds. Uh, you don't get there and then not do it. You, you get there and you keep working on it. In fact, you try to get it even heavier. So intonation is something you have to continually work on. I use several exercises to work on my intonation. They all involve playing against an open string or another pitch on the instrument or a drone or some other kind of point of reference. This is the key to developing good intonation. It's using your ears, 
in order to play in tune. You have to hear whether or not you're playing out of tune and then you have to adjust as often as you can. Use another point of reference and check your tuning. There's a famous story about, I believe, the great cellist Pablo Casals. And that story was every day when he woke up, he would play a C on his cello, then he would play a D on his cello, and then he would play an E. And every morning that E was a little bit out of tune. So he knew that he had to work on it. Uh, the moral of the story is constantly work on your intonation. There are going to be times where you don't play in tune. You got to learn to fix it and you got to learn to fix it quick. So keep working on it because it's going to be something you're going to be working on forever. So the second part of your question is about improving melodicism on the upright bass. The best advice I can give to you is to play melodies. Play melodies when you pick up the instrument, play melodies before you put the instrument away. Play melodies every day, every week, every month. We have to play melodies. There's a reason that horn players and pianists and guitarists are much better than we are traditionally at soloing. It's because the minute they have their instrument in their hand, they're taught to play a melody. Usually the minute we have our instrument in our hands, we're taught how to play a whole note to support that melody. You have to play as many melodies as possible. My favorite players, including the great John Patitucci, are all masters of phrasing as well. Learn how to play a melody in time with great rhythm and great articulation. And that's a step toward really being able to speak really strong, wonderful melodies on your instrument, but you gotta play them. You gotta play them every day. You gotta play them with a metronome. You gotta record yourself playing them and listen back. And you have to play them with very strong intent. Great phrasing, great rhythm, great articulation. Really mean what you're playing. That'd be my best advice. So that's it. I survived my first Q&A. I want to thank everyone for submitting a question. If I didn't get to your question, please feel free to write one in the comments. And I promise the next time I do something like this, I will get to your question. Thank you for submitting your questions. Thanks for watching. I have some very, very special and different things coming up on the channel in this next year, starting with the next video. So don't forget, if you like the video, smash that like button. If you're not a subscriber, click that subscribe button. I know you don't want to miss my next video. And if you like all things jazz, bass related, please come back every week for something totally original and new. So until next time, thanks for watching. Take care of yourself and please love your neighbor.